Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dan uh, Browner, Associate Professor of Medicine here at the University of Chicago, who went to medical school at uh, SUNY Syracuse and did his residency at Cook County, where he was chief resident. And he's interested in developing better ways to communicate and evaluate the decision-making capacity of persons with dementia using linguistics and discourse analysis. And his research interests include the historical study of resuscitation, cardiac arrest, and DNR, about which we're going to here now. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. <clears throat> I want to thank Mark and the McLean Center for uh, being a real intellectual home for me for the uh, last almost 20 years. Now on to my talk. How many of us have been exasperated by the family who wants us to do everything for their loved one? despite the fact that there's not much we can actually do that will help. I hope to show today that this exasperation is misplaced because it is us who created this option and we who continue to routinely offer it. To understand where the scripts that drive current performances of the negotiation of care for the very old and gravely ill, my methodology is historical analysis, which involves a close reading of the mostly medical literature, as well as articles from uh, lay press from the past. In order to appreciate uh, how everything came to be presents a long and interesting history and way beyond my 15 minutes. So I will zoom into what I consider to be the most compelling pieces of this history and distill that. We need to go back in time to, before, to a time when before resuscitation was the default for everyone whose heart stopped when cardiac arrest, a con uh, condition contingent on its treatment, could only occur in the operating room. Right before resuscitation became the first and quintessential embodiment of everything. And this takes us to the 1950s, which I consider to be a really neglected decade um, historically. Um, because it was during this time that our current indications for resuscitations were developed. We are currently operating under a framework that was developed in the 1950s at a time when resuscitation meant ripping open the chest and directly massaging the heart. And this is really the moment of the ascendancy of resuscitation, illuminating the fact that it was really never about the efficacy of specific techniques, but, but about the potential for success. It was during this time that the idea of, un of universal default resuscitation was born and the campaign to adopt it conceived. So it's essential to look at the circumstances that led to the broadening of the indications, asking what were these forces, medical, social, political, economic, um, which will hopefully inform uh, us now in the future, at our present time, to look at the possibilities for improving the current situation. So we're talking about a procedure that was developed in the, uh, actually in the 1880s, <coughs> um, but really the first successful cases were done in the turn of the last century. There's a New York Times article describing um, how life apparently is extinct has been renewed, or shall we say the dead themselves have been brought back to life. And this is a description of open resuscitation done in the operating room um, at the turn of the last century. So it, um, this was a procedure that was fairly uncommon for, for some time. You see here, I picked just three papers here. In 1906, there were 40 cases in the literature. Um, this is a paper that reviewed all the, all the cases. In 1945, another paper looking at, at the history of resuscitation reviewed all the cases that had been reported in the literature, and this numbered uh, 148 at that time. Of course, this is a slight underestimation because everybody's not reporting uh, all their attempts, but this gives you sort of an idea. Um, in 1953, a paper was published from a paper that was presented in 1952 that described 1,200 cases, which you can see is a, is a marked increase in the number of people undergoing resuscitation. Um, and the 50s really see a, a marked increase in, in this number. We see the initiation of courses in resuscitation um, and a group of advocates who were, who were very, very uh, excited about resuscitation because it worked. Um, and their goal in, in reporting their results um, from my review of the literature was not so much to determine whether the procedure worked or not. They were convinced that it worked. They had seen it work in their, in their own hands. Um, if not to bring the patient back to life, at least to restart the heart. 
um, which was the uh, beginning. Um, and so their, their real intent was, was not to prove that it worked, but to convince other physicians and the public that it worked, and that there was a vast potential for it to work better. One of the interesting things, in a time, in which I don't really have time to go into specifically here, is that the, the ways we, re, we talk about science, science and what was happening at the time have vastly changed since that time of, of, of in the 50s when they were reporting their results. And what we really see here is an evolution from case reports to outcome studies. The initial reports talking about cardiac resuscitation were, were reports usually of success, because most people don't want to report their failures, um, about how it worked in the operating room starting in, in the early 1900s. Um, but slowly, this changed into um, studies which were actually looking at outcomes and percentages. Um, and what was really interesting about looking at, this at these papers is what information do these authors choose to include and not to include? Because the standards of the time are really different. Um, and this becomes really critical um, in the 1950s when um, resuscitation, the decision is made to move resuscitation out of the operating room. This is really um, a really important decision that I don't think people um, really appreciate the import of it because it really led to um, a development of indications for resuscitation that um, to the indications that we have today. So this is a picture of a crash cart um, and that was used at Bellevue by Stevenson, the author of the paper that uh, reported the 1,200 cases in 1953. Um, and this is a crash cart that he developed. And what they did, uh, he developed a course and they taught the residents at Bellevue in the early 50s how to resuscitate patients on the wards. And they let them loose. Um, and they basically started resuscitating pretty much everybody who died um, on the wards. Um, and he did report his, the results of the study as part of this paper. Now, again, the 1,200 cases here were the, is, is actually a worldwide registry that he uh, got from a lot of physicians, and it, it includes the Bellevue experience. And the Bellevue experience is mostly, um, is part, mostly in the operating room, but 13% were outside the operating room. And interestingly, what he chooses, what he talks about in, in this paper and in subsequent books on uh, cardiac resuscitation, it's not so much what the patients had, what their conditions were, but where the, where the resuscitation occurred, because location really is the key here. First, the first place is the operating room, and then once we get out of the operating room, where does it happen? And so he breaks it down by location. And they actually have a pretty good success rate, so a 24% uh, success rate for uh, resuscitation outside of the operating room in this 13% of the cases here. But he never really breaks it down as to which locations were better or what the conditions were the patients have. And interestingly, there, there comes a critique, um, which I think is a really important paper that um, most people, <coughs> I, could, I dare say, have not read. This is a paper that was written by someone who was clearly inspired by Stevenson's work. And he um, he's tried to replicate his work of resuscitating people outside of the operating room using this technique. And what he found was a pretty abysmal. Uh, he was able to resuscitate one person uh, out of 24. And what he found, and that person was someone who was in the uh, actually radiographic suite who had undergone a bronchography, which was basically they would uh, blow uh, oil impregnated with, uh, with um, iodine into people's lungs um, to uh, take pictures of their, of their lungs to, so they could, uh, they could uh, visualize their, get like a, a bronchogram. Um, before the age of CAT scans, obviously. And that was the patient they resuscitated. And when he delved into what the other physicians were doing, he, a critique of the other reports, he found that in the vast majority, in just about all the patients who were successfully resuscitated, he found that a physician had usually performed the study which precipitated the arrest. So this, this technique works, it definitely works. The only problem with it is that it only works if the doctors have you know, killed you first, um, which is not something that is not something that's really um, made clear in any of these, uh, any of these papers. So, Despite the, you know, the sort of abysmal um, results of most of these studies in terms of uh, resuscitating uh, patients who had other illnesses who were not uh, undergoing iatrogenic deaths, um, there was a, a sense 
uh, that the indications needed to be very broad, um, in part because of the necessity of getting in there quickly, you know, time being a, an important factor, the, the, the uh, analogy of the fire drill is almost used, is, is often used, and Claude Beck, who's one of the real fathers of, of resuscitation, I think probably the man respon most responsible for how resuscitation looks today, um, um, made this uh, statement, which I think is, is, was pretty prescient. The possibility for successful resuscitation are greatest in patients who do not have primary diseases of the respiratory or circulatory systems. And previously, he had, had advocated that those people should not be resuscitated. But he sort of changes his mind beginning in the 1950s and says, goes on to say, however, a successful resuscitation is possible even in the presence of disease. And this is a, a, a major trope we see in uh, lots of resuscitation literature is that this notion of uncertainty. And so it should be attempted even though one anticipates that it will be futile. At the worst, the surgeon may gain valuable experience from the attempt. And so we see here sort of an early, um, an early rationalization, I think, for, um, for the start of what would become universal default CPR. So by the time um, the 1960s come, and this paper is published in July, um, when closed, uh, closed chest compressions were rediscovered um, and the first 20 patients reported, we see here a 70% success rate. Again, because these, these, they're using the same patients that, that the surgeons had been, um, had been attempting to resuscitate before. These are patients who were either in the operating room who were had, uh, getting cardiac casts, um, the vast majority of them had iatrogenic complications, um, and that was why they had, you know, a 70% success rate, which has obviously never been replicated. Um, now, the same group that, that started using uh, closed chest compressions <coughs> realized that what, as you broaden the, um, the definition, the indications for um, for resuscitation, you need to therefore change the actual definition of what constitutes cardiac arrest. And they actually say it um, specifically, the term once applied only to sudden death associated with anesthesia and sur surgery, but now cardiac arrest is now the sudden and unexpected sensation from whatever cause of circulation uh, from unexpected cessation from whatever causes circulation producing cardiac activity. Um, of course, people have talked uh, the notion of what's unexpected. You know, that's a very um, obviously um, dependent on the person, somebody else's expectations. Uh, and that's been one of the controversial things about the, um, that was initially um, discussed about cardiac arrest. But now we don't really even use the unexpected. You know, your heart stops, you have cardiac arrest by definition. I would say the third factor, the final, the force um, in the development of what I see as is, is universal um, um, default uh, resuscitation um, was uh, happened in the 60s and um, with the outlay of large amounts of uh, government dollars into um, the infusion of large amounts of, of government dollars into the uh, health care industry. And I, I would uh, suspect, and I, I'm looking forward to studying this further, that uh, a lot of the uh, healthcare dollars that were put into uh, medicine in the mid-60s were um, used to treat cardiac arrest. That this was a very sort of expensive condition that um, required very high tech um, and very um, expensive medical care, and that a lot of the money that came in at this moment um, um, would go into that um, pursuit. Um, thus making um, that treatment of cardiac arrest very much a part of uh, health care. And I would say at this point then um, with the establishment of uh, default CPR that resuscitation um, really became everything. Um, everything being um, a treatment without really an expectation that it would actually help this particular patient. And I think starting in the late 50s with the development of sort of the universal um, notion of resuscitation, um, that we see a conceptual shift in the locus of interest um, in the doctor-patient relationship. Um, that's, that's, that's very deep, and I think it's a, it's in a very important shift. And the shift is from the patient, the embodied individual whom you are caring for at that moment, and the question, what is, the be what is best for this patient at this moment? <coughs> 
Um, and it shifts to this sort of broader concept of patients. And that's the group of all patients and potential patients. And it's more of a theoretical construct based on a belief in the awesome power of resuscitation to help them. And so it, it's sort of this belief um, that resuscitation is a good thing in general that really changes how we interact with the patient that we're taking care of at that moment. <clears throat> of course, um, DNR comes along in the 70s, and I, and I see that as, as an attempt to fix um, this, this paradigm. And I think it, what, it, what it was was a really well-intentioned effort to transfer focus back to the patient in front of us. What's best for this patient at this moment? However, you know, there, that, that, that's the positive part of it. I think there are several problematic aspects of it as well. Um, it supports the current paradigm in which we have these defaults. Um, it tends to limit the focus um, to a future response to a procedure that in the vast majority of our patients won't help. And what, what I think it really gets in the way of is diverting attention from care in the present, this notion of care, of advanced care. And people tend to act in very, to think in very binary ways. So the opposite of everything becomes, you know, nothing. And so very often people will, will shift that, will see the definition, and it makes sense that, that DNR would, would, then, would then go on to mean that, even though everybody knows it shouldn't mean that. Um, very often, even though we know it doesn't, there, there's a lot of empirical evidence that shows that people do get um, less care when they are DNR, sometimes inappropriately. I, used to, I like to use the analogy of selling protection, which I'm not going to get into. Um, and w what I would call for um, at, this, at this juncture, after making this sort of hysterical analysis, is that um, is a refocus on care in the present for patients. And this, this requires a sort of a radical um, uh, alteration in sort of the way we talk about the potentials for treatment um, and truth-telling with our patients. And I think DNR needs to be sort of the last question that we bring up with our patients.